presents Mr. Peter Aiken. Peter, a moment in time. I want you to remember Jesus. the moment <laughs> when What's you this? slipped on a jacket and on the back of that jacket said, Rory Gallagher Crew. Do you remember that moment? Yeah, it was a long time ago. It was, I think I was about 16. It was in, yeah. We'd just done the Irish tour. It was Rory Gallagher kicked off in Tralee and we ended up in Belfast doing four nights in the Ulster Hall. And then it was over the Easter holidays. And there was a fellow from Skipperine, I can't think of his name. He was sort of Rory's main man, Tom, you call him. Second name, I can't remember. Big man, great fella. And uh, he asked me that I want to go on the next leg of the tour, and that's what I did. And I got a jacket on the boat, and I remember buying 200 Rothmans. And <laughs> that, was, that was just to be part of that. It was fantastic. You can't you know? get better than that no. as a 16-year-old. 16, wow. yeah. And w that was as a direct result of, of your dad? Um, yeah, we went out. I went out with my dad was only out a few of the shows, but I was with another guy called Mickey Conley, who was looking after it for, you know, making promotions. And we kicked off, as I say, in Tralee and uh, worked our way around the country and uh, it was just you know you got to know the crew and they got to know you and you sort of knew what to, how to set things up and help people and mm. they just asked me did i want to go and i said i'd love to go and it was and i like rory anyway i love the band and yeah love the music and uh, that was it and i went yeah. away for i think it was like uh, 16 or 17 days i think he played every day bar one mm. we you toured the length and breadth of england still in guest house it was great so at that time <coughs> did you have this like conviction within you that no I was going no, to do this, no. or no? You, do you know what it was? This was a no. A just I mean, it's it, it never. No, we never. Nobody could ever envisage it would turn into the business that it is today. Okay. Yeah. You know, and it was. Uh, it was also at the start of the. You know, the troubles that started. Oh, okay. My old fella was a teacher, and he, he packed in teaching to try promoting mm. from the show band. Then he was going to be a promoter at 1968. He, he got out of teaching and got into promoting, and he was promoting. I remember. I think it was Procol Harum. He was promoting. He was promoting Rory Taste. He did uh, Tom Jones, Engelbert Humperdinck, Humperdinck, they were oh. the big stars at the time. Yeah. And then in 1969, 1970, when it all kicked off, things got very quiet, but he always thought it was going to stop. You know, yeah. Nobody thought it would escalate That's the right. way it did. And then when it did escalate, there was a couple of years that nobody came. Yeah. Nobody. So you couldn't foresee that it was going to turn into this business yeah. that it is today, you know. What, what did your dad do for a, a living, for an income? Well, I mean, there was always certain stuff. I mean, like he, was, yeah. he, was, he was promoting Planksty at that time, Christy Moore at that time, things like that. But... Uh, Every once in a while, and I mean, Rory would, when he always came to Belfast, but I remember when he came to Belfast, I think it was 72 or 73, it, we didn't think it was unusual, but I mean, the, the gig was at 11 o'clock in the day. 11 o'clock yeah, in the morning? Yeah, 11 o'clock, New Year's Day, it was 11 o'clock in the day and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It had to be over before it got dark. That's just the way it was. Huh. And, but that was normal to people, you know, it was yeah. normal to us. It was, yeah. I mean, talking yeah. about it now, and uh, the police wanted the concert, everybody wanted the concert over, because Belfast was closed down at 5 o'clock then. There's no pubs or anything open, it was just a no-go zone. So this guy, Rory Gallagher, came up and he might have been doing, I think at that time he might have done two nights at City Hall here in Cork. But in Belfast he was doing four nights in Ulster Hall, so it was a big thing. Yeah. And then uh, there was always bits and pieces. And then I think like when the punk thing sort of started, 76, 77, you know, the bands then were, a lot of them always came, you know, they were coming because he wasn't involved in, he, he was involved with the undertones at the very start, but you had all these other bands cropping up, whether it was Stiff Little Fingers or, sure, yeah. you know, Elvis Costello, these type of people. They, they were constantly touring and, you know, so yeah. it all picked up again. And then at the beginning of the 80s, it sort of, you know, took off again. And w was that the, the kind of the time in the 80s when it came, OK, this is a but business think, that we can Well, not, no, I think it was, well, you, you didn't, you didn't, you, the promoting then, I suppose it's still, the, it's mm. like year to year, really, you know, it's, yeah. it's hard to have a long term plan, you know. Yeah. It's not like you have a five-year sure. business plan that you're going to, you know, you just hope yeah. that you have enough for that year or, yeah. or 18 months down the line, you know. Yeah. And is that because of the, the, the nature of it where yeah, like business. things may not work out, you could well, you take don't know. a hit and you just You just hope, you always think like, you know, like last year when I got the Ed Sheeran shows confirmed, I didn't think I was going to be busy that, if any big outdoors last summer. And I had, I had the misfortune the previous year, the Gareth Brooks thing. Mm. So I thought, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Would I ever be back in? Would I ever want to go back to Crow Park? And then mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I went and seen Ed, and I talked to the Crow Park, and he just said, "Okay, let's do it." And yeah. that, that came around, and I'd seen Ed in 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 Vicker Street, and I'd seen him, you know, and I could never, I didn't look at him and say, "This is a guy who's going to play outdoor stadiums," but he did, and he was incredible, and he was one of the maybe the two or three acts that I've ever seen that's actually better outdoor than he's indoor. 
Amazing. Yeah. You wouldn't think it, right? No, he's, a, a, he's an incredible artist. And guitar. He's, but it's more than just a guitar. I mean, the effects yeah. pedals and the way okay. he operates them, it's, a, it's, a, it's just showing itself when you're mm -hmm. looking down on him. Yeah. You see the way he can hold the tune. And the guy's dedicated to his talent and he's, uh, he's, a, bit, he's a bit of a genius, you know? So that, that question, that almost that uh, ability to, to predict the success of any particular gig or even, you know, promoting an artist. To, it's very yeah, hard to what's predict. the, the alchemy But there is, that, you can't really work? predict because most, you know, they all have talent, you know. Yeah. I mean, you can get up in this room and, and hold 40 people's attention, that's a great talent to have, yeah. you know. And there's very few people can do it. But, um, yeah, it's impossible to predict because if we knew what it was, they would, you know, yeah. you wouldn't have losses and winners and there would sure. be no need for us. Yeah. To be saying, who's the mug's going to guarantee this show? We don't need for us. <laughs> because you can have great talent, and just because a show isn't packed doesn't mean it's, it's a bad act. Yeah. Like, I promote a lot of bad acts that have packed places out. But <laughs> it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't necessarily it doesn't ne yeah. it doesn't necessarily work like that, you know? Yeah. So it's impossible to predict. We hear it all the time. The next album's going to be amazing. You might be even sent a couple of tracks, and you listen to it. And, you, and it is. It, yeah. you, you convince yourself it's great. Or, or it is great, and then nothing happens. Yeah. You look at something like Justin Bieber, and nobody could, you know, everybody, I'm promoting Justin Bieber in November, but nobody could have predicted. It's the biggest comeback I've ever seen. Really? You know, he's back and he had four singles in the top 10, and yeah. they're still in the top 10. Yeah. And nobody could have predicted that. And yeah. it, that's the way the charts is now. It's just, it's unpredictable that he's got four in the charts, and, and Adele, I think, is going to have two next week in the charts. And Sean Mendy has released a single in October, and he's number one in the UK this week. You know, just, mm. it's not like it used to be. It's completely different, so it's impossible to predict. And every act that comes out, whether it's a Shawn Mendes or a, or a like, or when you see the people who are behind Justin Bieber, you could say it's no shock mm. that he's the best producers and best songwriters behind him. And the best songwriters and the best producers want to write for the biggest star. They don't want to write yeah. for somebody who's going to have a hit in Ireland and the UK. Yeah. They want to write for a star that's going to be a worldwide hit. They've yes. got a great song. They want to give it to the best person they can, you know. But that doesn't necessarily work out because it used to be the top 30 was important, then it was the top 20. But it really is the top 10 now and the top 5, really, you know. Okay. That's what's important. Yeah. But you've still got people coming out. I remember being at a conference one time, and uh, I think it was Irving Azoff, the manager of the Eagles. He stood up and he was comparing the film industry to the music business. Says like, if there's 200 great movies, or there's 200 movies released in a year, you'd be lucky if two or three of them are like classic. Yeah. You know, five stars out of five. Sure. You get all the hullabaloo. This here's a fantastic action, pack, thrill, mm. thrill a minute movie. You go to see it, and it's not. Yeah. But the fact is, when you release 200 CDs or 200 albums, they're all of a very, very high quality. Yeah. You know, I went to see Lucinda Williams. We had her on Vicker Street last week. It was an amazing show. First time I've ever seen her. Well, absolutely brilliant, right. you know? Yeah. And I mean, when I was doing the marquee, when I do all the shows in the marquee, and people said, hey, what show surprised you? Most of the shows I know what are going to be really good shows. But the year that Biffy Claro did, I'd never seen Biffy Claro. I knew the music. Yeah. But I went to see them, and they were incredible. There you go. What a rock band, you know? Yeah. And uh, nice guys. And so, you know, it's hard to predict. It's impossible yeah. to predict because the, the quality of music that's coming out, not just in Ireland, but worldwide, is at such a high standard. And it's good. So given, good. given that unpredictability, is there an element of, um, I would even use the word magic, to sustain yourself in the promotions game, given that you, you, know, you can be so exposed? <coughs> so give us a sense of the, kind of the, the dynamics of, kind of, call it boom and bust or up and down. You know, that but it's you always, that's what I'm saying, like, just because you promote somebody and it doesn't work out, it doesn't mean that it's not going to come back around again or with some other, you know, so yeah. just because every show doesn't sell, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it can be a great show and, you know, it's a long road, and a lot of people remember that you, you were involved and you'd done yeah. a good job and you kept with it regardless, you know, and yeah. artists, a lot of artists, like I mentioned, Justin Bieber, a year ago, nobody wanted him. Now everybody wants him. <laughs> you know, he's red yeah. hot. I mean, this guy could sell at Croke Park tomorrow morning if he wanted yeah. to. Yeah. So that's how hot he is. So yeah. you never know what's going to come around the corner. Yes, yes. Now, whoever thought that women would, and that, you know, women, I remember a long time ago they said the women couldn't sell tickets, but yeah. the biggest seller of tickets at the moment are females. No. You know, Pink is like, you know, has set the record in, yeah. in Australia, 54 arenas she sold. You know, Beyonce's coming, I think she'd be in Ireland this year, but she's red hot again. Yeah. You know, you look at, uh, you know, the different females that are selling tickets, ticket loads by bucket. So if, from the perspective of like a guy like me, as a, as a, a punter, or let's say yeah. a fan of music goes to gigs and so on, just kind of break down the, the dynamics really of the, the industry. And especially I'm interested just from your perspective, um, the center of gravity between the artist and let's say in the venues. Um, are you, you know, where do you see the, the role of the promoter? Is it on the artist side, the venue side, or, or is it a combination of those two things and Well, more? the first thing is, is the artist sells the tickets. Yeah. You know, we help. You know, yeah. but I mean, if the people don't want to come, there's nothing we can do. There's no magic wand a promoter can do. Sure. 
So that's that's the number one client, and then yeah. the client after that there is the is the customers. Sure. That's who you want to make sure that whatever you can do, that they have a good time and come back. You know, and uh, the venues, you know, it's it's down the food chain. Yeah. I mean, the charge. You know, some venues do charge a lot to rent it, but it wouldn't be. You know, there's some magnificent. I mean, the Crow Park is a magnificent stadium. Yeah. What they're going to build here in Cork, when I've seen the plans, is going to be a magnificent stadium, and that does add a lot to the show. You know, but it really is the artist that makes it. Yeah. And then that being the case, then is the is maybe the key to the to the game is having the relationship with the artists, or is is that the case? Well, it's difficult now. You know, you don't. I mean, it used to be back in the day, like we we'd be picking them up at the airport and things like that. But yeah. There's a lot of people between a promoter and an artist now. Some it's not, but there is a lot of people between a pro and sometimes a lot of people, you know, around them, handlers, PR people, and they're all good people, but yeah. just that's, that's the, you know, because of social media and all this, yet they're all, you know, they, there's people on the road protecting all that, looking at social media, sending out messages. And so the artist has this relationship straight away that he never had before with uh, his fans or mm. uh, the world, let's say, yeah. that they can text or, you know, yeah. Facebook and Twitter and all these type of things and they, a lot of the big artists would, would carry so somebody on the road would be like that yeah and then they might have you know the people around them to make sure because they do work extremely hard yeah they're different from the rest of us their lives revolve around eight o'clock in the day right you know and you don't hear that if you think of all the shows we've done on the marquee I don't think any of them have ever been cancelled you know for any reason you know because the artists yeah. didn't want to turn up they turn up and when you look at any other business when people cry off sick and do x y and z the artists don't they're yeah. there every day and everything, they can't do anything during the day because everything revolves around 8 o'clock. So when they arrive at the venue, they're there to work. It's not as if they're going to, they're there to hang out and talk to me. Yeah. They're there to get ready. They're sound checking. They're, you know, they're yeah. busy. They're getting ready. They're relaxing. They're getting ready what they're going to do with the show. Bruce brings the, the minute he arrives at the show, he's working. Yeah. He never stops. He's rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing. And then anybody that's seen the Cork show, he walked out. The minute that there was like 5,000 people in the crowd, he just walked out and sound checked yeah. with the audience there. You know, I mean, yeah, this yeah, guy yeah. never stops. Right. So, if, if, is it true then that you know, we all hear the stories and maybe a lot of it is mythology of the the rock and roll lifestyle and no. all that. Has that has that kind of evolved because it's, of the it's professionalism a, yeah, of the game? Yeah, it is game? professional. It's a business. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not like that at all anymore. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No. So how how then? The can shows you used to be like if you look back at shows back in the early sixties, the way bands toured, they were doing twenty minutes. Might have been, a, you know, five really? bands on a package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 minutes each. I mean, there was a lot of free yeah. time and they were all together and all hanging out. Now, it's, yeah. you know, some of these artists are doing two and a half hours. You know, Neil Young's doing a tour at the moment. He's got Willie Nelson's two sons in the band. They're doing three hours, 20 minutes. Amazing. You know. You have to be fit to do that. That's what it is. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just, that's what he's doing. And, you know, you can't be hanging out no. doing whatever yeah, when yeah, you're doing a show yeah. like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, what I was going to ask was, given the, let's say, the evolution of the, the machinery around artists, is has it become more difficult for someone like yourself to build those kind of that, those kind of no, close contacts? The most important thing for us is, is the relationship is with the managers and the okay. agents. That there's just as important as it is with uh, the artist. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, the, the, like when they meet a fella like me, it's, it's no different from the fellas they're going to meet in Manchester. It's the same person. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then how 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 does Aiken Promotion sit in the in the let's say <coughs> the spectrum of promotion? Companies, I mean, there are like mega businesses and, mm -hmm. you know, some fella based in wherever. Obviously, you guys are independent guys somewhere in between. How, how do you see that? What do you mean? Like, in terms of where do you fit in the spectrum of... But it's getting more and more difficult, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's getting more and more corporate. There is, uh, yeah. there's, I used to say there was a, you know, there's a 500 pound gorilla in the corner called Live Nation, but now it's yeah. like a 500,000 pound nuclear bomb. <laughs> right. You know, and they, yeah. they dominate. I mean, and an yeah. artist comes in and, you know, if an artist comes... It's like sometimes when, you know, an artist would be saying, I wonder why Live Nation haven't offered me the money. Okay. You know, it's like, you know, and they do offer a lot of money and they can offer it up front. And, you know, it's a business. Good luck to them. Mm. You know, they've, they've, there's more shows because of them. And, uh, but they do, they do weigh, you know, and uh, you just hope that the relationship that you do have, that there is a lot of acts that still want the guy on the ground who's there every day, who's actually promoting the show himself as opposed yeah. to, you know, signing a band and then it gets filtered out to a PR company or sure. an ad agency. Yeah. That there's a guy, sometimes certain acts, and even some of the new acts, they like to know that if somebody's got their, their money down, that they think they're going to work a lot harder, yeah. that they think they've got an interest, that they think they're going to work the radio stations, work the local media, that they've actually got an interest. Because if you're just rolling up a big tour and you're paying X, Y, and Z of money, 
and it loses money in a certain city and it makes money in another city, the whole thing's crossed, collateralised the deal. So it's not the same. Sure. So you so hope that that will keep you in. But no, yeah. going forward, you can see more and more of the bigger tours are going to go like that. Mm. I think they will anyway. So you could get more and more marginalised then. You just have to scale back your operation and just do what you're good at. Yeah. Or hang on to the few acts that you can hang on to. It's great that the Irish music is doing so well at the moment. There's so many yeah. great Irish acts out there, you know. Yeah. Give us a sense of the, the mechanics, let's say, even to take the example of Ed Sheeran that you mm. brought up from last summer. Um, like, what are the steps that you go through to, from the idea of, hey, we could put Ed on, or we do Croke Park? You know, how does that process work, and is it well, we different met, every time? We had work. We met Ed. I met myself and another fellow who works on Semi, Brian Berry. We went to see Ed in Whelan's. We walked in. He was doing this gig for VHI, Storyteller. And we walked in, and it was a bit of a dress room in Whelan's, not... It's a very small dress room. Ed was in the corner, and uh, a couple of the love hit guys were there. They're big oh, fans. Yeah. They were all sitting there talking to him. And Robbie Keane and Robbie Keane's wife and the wife's mother was there. And I was like, okay. Jesus. <laughs> and we wa I walked in, yeah. and he says, "I know what you're here for, you know, because right. we'd we'd made a proposal to." Him. Okay. And the manager just says, "No, once he's he's not doing it anymore." Okay. And uh, then we just talked to Ed, and Ed says, "You know, he just he that's the way he says, yeah, I think I'd like to do that." Yeah. And that's how it came about. Wow. And then he texted the manager, and the manager came back and said, oh, Jesus, I thought, yeah. you know. <laughs> and then it was put together as quickly as that. But, yeah. you know, the artists, the artists still have a lot of control. Somebody like Ed Sheeran would have a lot, still have a lot of control. Smart guy, you know, well tuned in. Like, but when you tell him something, we told him like, how magnificent Croke Park was and what a stadium it was and about the GA and mm. things like that. There. And he bought into it. You know, he, he believed us. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know. And then he came and he said, this is magnificent, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it was compared. I mean, I seen the Wembley show. The Wembley show was great, but Crow Park was spectacular. Yeah, it's you really have a, a strong um, affinity for the venue. You, you, yeah. you know, I've heard, heard, heard you talk. It's sort about of. It. <laughs> yeah. Well, we promoted all the gigs at the start. We promoted you. We were the first person. There. You know, it was hard to get it opened up back in the day. But yeah, we put Neil Diamond in there, and then we were going to put Sam Garfunkel back in there in '84, and then we put Neil Diamond in there, and then we put uh, we did uh, you two the Unforgettable Fire there. Then we brought them back. We did the Joshua Tree there. We did a couple of nights. We did Simple Minds when they did the tour there. Uh, the Water Boys were a special guest and Lloyd Cole and the Commotions. And, uh, you know, so we'd done a good few <coughs> gigs there. So, and that was my background. Our background was a very strong GA background. So naturally, and it was disappointing that, you know, we were excluded for a number of years. And then it was great to get back in. And then it happened. What happened was happened. And, I'm still tra traumatized by the whole thing. Okay, okay, because uh, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure whether to bring it up or not, but now that you have, um, I heard you saying last summer that in the 12 months since the um, Garth Brooks <coughs> thing had ended, that a day hadn't passed that someone hadn't yeah. brought it up with you. I was at a wedding recently, and somebody said something to me about it. I didn't like it what they said, but they said, mm. and uh, yeah, it is. But I mean, you know, the, the, the day that it happened, you know. When it did happen, I never thought till the day, it, it lasted 14 days, would you believe, until yeah. we, and I always thought every day we, that was the it's day it was going to happen, you know, yeah. we got it resolved, because like, everybody got involved, you know, from the top of the government, you know, everybody, every government party got involved, I met everybody, you know, and they always said, we're going to get this resolved, and when you think about it, it was 400,000 tickets set, so, like, everybody lost, Yeah. everybody, that's right, like, nobody more than Garth, you know, I mean, he lost millions on it, yeah. he paid everybody. And, you know, there was a big film crew coming in and they were, they were shooting this documentary. It was a day in Dublin or something, a day in the summer, something. They had a work entitled to it and that was going to be shown on television at 8 o'clock on ABC television wow. on, on Sunday evening, like two weeks after it. And all those people had to be paid and the venue lost out. I lost out big. I lost a lot of money on it. You know, all the hotels. I mean, everybody lost yes. on it. That's what was frustrating about it. Or that's what... And I had also seen the plans because he brought in the fellow who had done a couple of Super Bowls. He was the fellow who was built on the whole thing. And he had showed us on a computer, uh, he had done up a whole PowerPoint of what this was gonna look at. And nobody would ever seen anything like it. Yeah. And nobody would ever see anything like it again because nobody, not crazy, Gareth's not crazy, but nobody is as mad as he is that he would spend everything yeah. on this show. Yeah, wow. I know you've probably learned some business lessons from it, but how has that experience changed you and your outlook on? Not really, on you know, I mean, it was just, I suppose, to go for five was, you just get caught up in it, you know what I mean? It, it wasn't greed, I mean, you know, well, you always look at the bottom line as well, but it was just like to do something, you know, that could never be done before, because 
in the business, which is it's like I know all, I know any major promoter in the world, I would know them on first name terms, or okay. you know, I'd have their phone number, so I talk to them and all. This was my day, sort of, to be yeah. the number, the biggest yeah. show that you know. Yeah. There's an award given out at the end of the year for the Has Grossman concert, you know, in this Billboard Awards that we okay. go to, and I would have won that hands oh. down, you know, and yeah. that would have been a big thing. Yeah, it? yeah. And I, I, I was sort of thinking of when I'd sold the tickets if I'd gone up to get the award, nearly, you know. <laughs> okay. I was always one. I, I, I was always, I was always one step ahead of myself. Yeah. So it was just, it just wasn't about that, about money or that. It was just to do something that I don't think I'll ever be repeated again. Yeah. I can't see any band ever doing that, that amount of people. And it really did capture people's imaginations. And I For think, sure. I don't know if, if we come back, would we ever get anywhere, you know, we would get that type of, you know, it just, yeah. it was on such a roll. And everybody was coming in for it. His guest list was spectacular, you know. Really? His was guest list that was to beat every guest list. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I was yeah, just yeah. like, I can't believe these people are coming in to see him. Yeah, yeah. And it then was, we were going to do a few really... things around the city, a few surprise gigs and wow. small things. And there was a whole big plan organised and it was just, everything went very yeah. shape. But when you explained what we were going to do and what we were trying to do to different, you know, representatives of government and blah, blah, blah. They all just said, no, don't worry, we're going to get this on. Don't worry, this is going to be resolved. And then I was relaying that back to America. You know, I met X, Y, and Z, and they were like, oh, that's fantastic. And he says, they're going to get it resolved. And then nothing. Do you think that... So it was embarrassing, you know, and yeah. a bit humiliating, you know. Yeah. How, how long before the, um, let's say, the feeling in the pit of the stomach dissipated? Before I suppose you it never really does, you know, because people, you know, it's always brought up, like, and, yeah. uh, you know, I even brought up myself tonight. You so, did? <laughs> um, <laughs> It's just one of those things that it's always going to be there, you know. And yeah. My youngest son said to me, Dad, don't worry, it'll be unreeling back the years. And I thought, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's a look forward to. Because he knows I, I watched that. Oh, I got the DVD box that a few oh, years yeah. ago. I watched it and I love it. Uh, speaking of your, your son, uh, is there a next generation I don't know. involvement in I don't know. They're the doing their own thing at the moment, but you know. Yeah. The, one of them has a good interest in music and we'll see what happens, but it's, yeah. it's, it's different, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's tough. Because you, you gave non-music uh, business career a good shot, right? You, you experimented with accountancy and a few yeah. things, is that, Look, is that right? A firm so, down here, a Cork firm, I worked down yeah. here for a year. And what, what, what brought you back to it? Was it just that it was No, I did, so a, well I did it at school, I was at boarding school and uh, there was a priest there, Father Kelly, and he asked anybody who wanted to do accountancy and there was only four of us that put up our hands for some reason. <laughs> and uh, all four of us did very well. Okay. And all four of us, could, but maybe it's just the fact that there was only four of us to teach, and we all done. So yeah. then, when you were going to college, I was in America at the time, and I uh, applied for different things. And, and then I remember my mum ring my mum up at a coin box somewhere, and she says, "You've been accepted to accountancy." And I went, "Oh yeah, I'll do that." Great. And looking back, I'm sorry I did it. You know, I yeah. mean, it was the worst course I've ever done. Really? <laughs> really? The worst thing ever. They've just. <laughs> Just, just, you know, there's so many, so many other courses that, you yeah. know, people I knew were in other courses and they just had much better time than we had, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Ours was tough, tough, tough. And yeah. the people in the class were, like, dreadful. Really? <laughs> yeah. Were they stereotypical? Oh, listen, I no, better stop this straight away because <laughs> some of our best clients are accountants. No, no, um, no it's, just, it's just the way it was, you know, just, like, we were always working and yeah. I always remember these people that were doing politics or something and they were always going away and doing mm. things and drinking and yeah just we were never doing anything we were just like <laughs> yeah yeah um, i want to go go back to speaking about your dad because you you, you uh, brought him up at the yeah. the start um, michael earlier in, in in the night talked about the influence of hot press mm. but uh niall stokes from hot press when, when your father passed away he described him as a towering figure in irish music yeah and that is high praise yeah um in terms of an influence uh, in, into even today in the way that you're operating. D tell me about his influence on you. Well, he was, a, he, was a, he was a good man, you know, a great man. And, you know, it was good. You know, it was different. You know, I look at my own relationship with my kids now, and I think it's a bit different than he had with me. It was just a different type yeah. of parent, and, you know, but yeah. he was a good man. And, I mean, I did, I suppose, grow up with cost me a lot of heartache and all that. I yeah. suppose the best thing I'd ever said about him was that he never once carried it. You know, once he'd give out there, you know, that was it. It was okay. over the next day. But he was a good man, and he got into show business sort of a bit accidentally. And... Uh, he had a good flair for it, and I think people liked him because at that time in the late 60s, and he got a reputation as, as paying and not, and not stitching anybody up, and that, that stayed with him forever. Right. And he built a very good business and a, you know, a good name, and uh, he was extremely honourable, and it was, uh, it was tough because like, right up to the last thing, like, I remember like, he wanted to, he wanted, we had an ad in the Sunday Independent, and he could hardly see in the last day or two, and he wanted to see the ad. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I do. So yeah. it was uh, tough, you know, yeah, and uh, yeah. it's... 
you know, it's very, it's, it's you know, I don't, I don't talk about it too much, but he was, yeah. as Niall Stokes said, he was, he was, he, he was a good man, he was a good father and a yeah. good, a good man. Yeah. He was a good promoter too, he, he, and he loved it, you know, he loved yeah. the business. Yeah. He loved being around it and, uh, he, you know, that's it. Um, yeah. I think the Gareth Brooks thing would have put him over the edge, but yeah. you think? <laughs> he wouldn't have liked, I always think, I always <laughs> That was the only time I said, "Thank God he's not around to see yeah. this." Yeah, <laughs> he'd have been, he'd have thought that had been the worst ever to be dragged. You know, for he always liked that, that you know, that, people knew him, but he always liked that we weren't that, you know. You were kind of behind the. the yeah, sort of, you know, because yeah. it was him that always told me. He says, "Never forget the fellow on the stage sells the tickets, not you." Yeah. You know, that's what it is. You know, yeah. they've got a remarkable talent that you know. So yeah. that's where he would instill that, and you know, and about yeah. treating people as you know as fairly as you could. Drive a hard deal, but treat people as fairly as you did. If you do something and then, you know, you think that it's a bad deal, but you've agreed it, you've got to stick to it, and that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. Fair play to you. Between it, him and Gareth Brooks, I think I'm ready for therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an interesting question, right? Because, you know, some of the lessons that you were sharing with us there from, from your experience with, with, with your late father, <clears throat> what kind of things do you think... You know, if you had to put it together a little package for, for you know, whether some of your own children get into the business or, or someone else, just in terms of like the things I have learned about life and, and the promotions business, what kind of stuff would go on that? I suppose the most important thing, and, and you know, is to get good people around you, you know. Yeah. That's been a big advantage to yeah. me to get good, you know, colleagues around me, and that's been important, and get a good account. Yeah. And uh, that is good, you know, good bookkeepers, and yeah. you know, but good colleagues around you, good people that you think you. You look forward to seeing every day, not look forward to, but you enjoy working every day. That's the most yes. important thing. Yes, yes. Um, <coughs> in terms of the immediate future, give us a no. sense of like what's on the, the horizon. You know, we're, we're starting to a new year. How do you see it shaping up? It's not bad. We had a good weekend last weekend with, uh, with Kevin Hart on in The Point. We did two shows in one night. We did uh, a six o'clock show and a, a 10.30 show. Mm -hmm. and that was good with uh, 18,000 people at it. Wow. So when you say it, that's comedy, so at the same time we did four shows with Tommy Tiernan around Dublin, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we had three shows with Des Bishop on the same weekend. So I mean, that, that's strong for comedy in one weekend in Dublin. And then as I say, we did Cindy Williams last weekend. Tomorrow night we've got uh, Full Living Criminals on. Mm -hmm. Then we've got, uh, who else we got on? Have we got, who have we got on Sunday night? I forget if we've gotten something. Like then we're announcing, like for Cork, we'll be announcing, uh, I think this Friday we're announcing the cores for Cork, Live the Marquee. Ooh. And uh, we've got five or six other announcements coming up for Cork. It's just, but we're also looking, you know, people have asked for availability for 2017 mm -hmm. for certain acts, not for the Marquee, but for yeah. certain outdoor shows that they're trying to plan. So that it's always ongoing. There's never a day that somebody's not asking us. Sometimes we don't get every act, but they're asking some, sometimes for an alternative proposal. Okay. You know, and I think when Parky Keith comes on board, the promoter is prepared to say, I'll give you a Croke Park or I'll give you the Viva Stadium and a, a Cork show. That's what, you know, yeah. you'll, see, you'll see it expanding a bit more, you know. Yeah. So talk, I guess, locally um, for a few minutes. Tell us, how did the, the marquee concept emerge? Can you remember what was the seed? I told the conversions this old. I mean, <laughs> okay. Don't get caught out. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was the year of the culture thing. Yes. And yeah. I had a bit of process. I knew one or two people who were involved in that and they okay. asked me. So I went down and had a chat with him and, and I got the uh, basic story as I come up with, I think it was Dwight Yogel, um, Diana Ross, maybe Bram Wilson. And I was at a meeting, I was just talking, it was just a, sort of informal. It wasn't 100% guaranteed. And uh, maybe one or two other acts on it. And they went, no, we don't want that. We don't want that. And I went, what? So I says, okay. I'll do it myself. Yeah. That was it. Wow. Because I couldn't promote by committee, you know? Yes. Because even, that's what I go back to, even if I promoted an act, it was Dwight Yogel and we had, Twike Yoke on that first year, it was a great show. It's only two and a half thousand, maybe three thousand went there, but a great support act called BR 549. Sort of rockabilly, you know, okay. country outfit. It's a great show, but it might have lost money that night, but it was still a great show. Yeah. And we had, as far as I was concerned, there was two thousand people there who'd never, who would never have come to the marquee. And at Dwight Yoke, when we played Cork Opera House, I still, that's when I would think, he might have done a thousand tickets. Mm. He couldn't have done two nights at the Opera House. The fact that we had it in the marquee and there was so much publicity about it, yeah. we'd somehow got it to over two and a half thousand people. Yeah. And people come from everywhere to do it. And I don't think people would come from everywhere to go to the Cork Opera House. That's when I sort of thought, that's, oh, that's could true. be on to something here, you know. For sure. So that's when I decided to do it myself. And it wasn't like, I didn't do it like bravado, because then I asked them, later on they asked me, could they, you know, I don't think things worked out. That, you know, and they said, could they put it in their program? Mm -hmm. I said, there's no problem. Oh, okay. So they did all that there. And, but that's how it came about. When somebody 
maybe just I heard them saying, we don't fancy that, we don't fancy that. Yeah. And that's when, you know, when you're a promoter and, you know, once you book the act, you think it's, yeah. you know, it's right and that's yes. what you want to do and you want to, you mm. believe in the act and it, that's what I go back to, just because it doesn't sell out doesn't mean it's, a, or it doesn't do well, doesn't mean it's not a great act. Because when I stand down in the marquee, we've done over, I don't know many shows, 120, 130, I've never been there and looked at the act on stage and said, you know, isn't that incredible that the atmosphere or the, the reception yeah. that they're getting, you know? Yeah. And they're entertaining maybe four or five thousand people, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great story. So when you say you did it all yourself, so I mean, the A to Z of, of putting the thing on, I mean, did you, did you mm -hmm. run the show? Well, I went to Cork City Council and I had a chat with them and then they came up with this idea of the, maybe being able to use the showgrounds. Yeah. Then I went and met them and that was all done like in the space of two days. Yeah. And then it was, uh, that was it. And then we moved to the site we're on at the moment, so that was it. And I, I think, for me at least, looking at it, the most remarkable thing about that isn't so much the fact that it was done for that, that year where there was mm. momentum and you know, there was budget mm. and all this kind of stuff, but the fact that you've sustained that and grown, well, you, you tell me like in Well, you never way, know, you mean, you, think that, you, you, you always think that it'll do, you know, maybe one or two years, but then, yeah. you know, once, you, once, once, once Dylan came, that was a big thing. Yes. You know, Neil Young came, like Roger Waters, like I'm, I went to see Roger Waters, or Roger Waters was the generator broke that night. It was weird night. That, <laughs> but he was there and he loved it. You know, he mm. really did. And I went to see him in, uh, I went to see him in the Hollywood Bowl, in wow. Los Angeles. Yeah, fifteen thousand at the exact same show, and they brought me in to say hello to him. He's a very personal guy. He talked yeah. to anybody, Roger, including including me. So, <laughs> brought it. He says to me that court guy was amazing. Yeah. I'm not just saying that. That's what yeah. he said. And he was going to play in the Hollywood Bowl. All these actors and actresses there. All, all the showbiz was there. And he just he said that was a fantastic gig. And so what, what, what elements I make it? I think it was it? the fact that the way the crowd sang along to every song okay. that night, and yeah. just, you know, yeah. it, was just, it was a great night. Anybody that's been to the Marquee, they know, most people would yeah. know that it's a tremendous atmosphere, you know. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I remember, I don't know if anybody's seen the night that Rod Stewart was on the Graham Norton show, and the girl was in the red chair, and she says, uh, I was at the Cork gig, the Marquee, yeah. and I, get, I threw my hat on the stage, and Rod wore it, and uh, Graham Norton says, no, there's no gig like that in Cork, and bang. And Rod says, oh, there is. No. I played it last summer. It's an amazing gig. Wow. Yeah. Hang on. Let me just uh, pull the lever there. Yeah. No, it's all right. We have no um, moving parts on your red chair. Uh, yeah, I was actually worried that the whole Garth Brooks thing, I'd go back. Yeah. But anyway, not yet, not yet. But tell us, um, the future of the Mar Marquee, obviously there's moving parts now with the, the stadium and there's this convention center, if it happens, should happen. Uncertain future, or well, I suppose you, you know, we'll see. But I mean, I, ho I hope that the concert venue is built. Yes, I think it'd be great. I think yeah. it'd be uh, it'd be great if they built one in Galway too, or yeah. a proper one in Limerick. I mean, all these things, you know, you go all around uh, France and they've built all these type of venues everywhere, and uh, you know, they all do reasonably well and they find their feet eventually. But it needs government support. You see, I don't think it can't. It will not survive in the private sector building something of that standard. You know. Yeah, it and won't. do you think there is twelve months? Um, no. market in a no. place like this for no. those kind of gigs? No, no. it would be quiet you know, during the summer and stuff like that because everybody yeah. wants to do festivals and things like that. Yes. And, you know, I still think there'll be a room for the marquee still. Yeah. Because they think it's a bit looser and it's not in a you know, concert venue and it's... Well, that's just, it. It's just different, you know. Yeah. But I do think yeah. a concert venue of five or six thousand would do very well in Cork yeah. all year round. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully all, all those elements mm. will, um, will, will come in. Um, in terms of your if there even is such a thing as a typical day in your uh, work, well, what kind of things would, would typically happen most days? Well, most days, maybe three or four days a week, you'd, you'd be going to a gig at night, just for okay. a bit. You know, you wouldn't, yeah. you know, you just go up and you'd, ha you'd talk to people and, ha you know, watch it. And it depends who the gig is. You might stay behind and say, say to them afterwards. So it could be anything. Normally, it'd be, it's, we'd start each morning about eight, half eight. You know, we'd, mm -hmm. there'd be different... Normally start with breakfast at half eight, meeting different people for breakfast, sure. and that's how we, that's how my day nor normally goes. Yeah. And then we have it's it's a structured like most business. Certain days we have certain meetings in the afternoon about certain things. Yeah, and uh, that's how it goes. So give give us a sense of Aiken Promotions, the kind of the you know the various things which involved. Vicar Street, we we mm. might have mentioned. Yeah. Get, tell us about your involvement with, with the venue there and how that came about and what you're doing today with well, it. Well, it's just I knew that uh, originally it was going to be Harry Crosby and Christy Moore were going to open this place, and uh, Christy was going to. The idea that was he was going to have, you know, he was going to play on it a certain amount of days of the year. And then they approached me. I was at we were we were launching Michael Flatley's uh, his first ever show, and I met Harry at that there, and he says, "Have you seen this new venue and built?" And it was only it was only 
they're only broken ground on it. I went up and had a look at it, and you know, it's a bit off the beaten track. Yeah. But at then, every, but because everybody's saying that it was the only place for Dublin to expand. Okay. And then I knew this well known publican in Dublin, and he told me he was looking at a place across the road from it, so it would be great if we get okay. involved in this. So yeah. that's how I got involved in it, and you know. Yeah. And then uh, we're there 12 years, and it passed so quickly. You know, the first act we put in there was Tom Robinson. Really? It was wow. great. Wow. And then we had Lloyd Cole in for a couple of nights. And it was great. And then, you know, Henry Rollins came in, did a spoken word song. And then we had this amazing show by John Cale. And then with Dave Brubeck, the jazz guitarist, he was in the first like 10 days. And then we put the Unbelievables in for eight weeks. <laughs> and, and they sold every ticket. Amazing, and the great thing about that there was that there were so many people, it was 700 people. And that was like nearly 5,000 people a week. Yeah. Over eight weeks, it was 40,000 people that come to the venue. And the Unbelievables were the hottest act in the town at that time. So to have that amount of food traffic, and you know we were leafing it every night, telling people what was coming in over the next, you know, coming up to Christmas, and then everything started, you know, and then bands got to know about it and like it, so it really sure. built from the ground up. And has the the experience and that collective, let's say those, those dozen years of all that relationship building of you know running a venue, has that in, enhanced your ability to promote, or no, like, what have it, you learned from I it? Think, I think it gave me good, it gave me access that I hadn't got to, especially Irish acts. Yeah. Like I knew them, but I didn't really know them, you know. So I ended up like. You know, working with the frames a lot, working with Glenn Hanser them in turn, working a lot. You know, when I, when I opened up the marquee the first, I'd already promoted Paddy Casey a few times, so I brought Paddy Casey to the marquee when I went to him and said, I'd like you, you know, do the marquee. They agreed straight away. Yeah. And then when Paddy Casey played down the marquee and he sold it out straight away. So yeah. I had not, I, I, it was a, a breakthrough into working with a lot of Irish acts. Then it, then comedy took off. You know, we do all of Tommy Tiernan's work. Yeah. Doing like 100, 120 shows a year now with Tommy. You know, Darrow Brain, Jason Byrne. And as a result of that, that's why we had sort of, in one way, we uh, got to know Kevin Hart's people quite well because we sure. had, we'd done the comedy festival every year in the Ivy Gardens and we did Louis C.K., who's a huge comedian wow. now, but we did him uh, two years running the marquee, maybe 40 or 50 people at it. Yeah. But the guy who looks after Louis C.K. looks after Kevin Hart and that's where that sort of came about. Oh, no. And the idea for the comedy festival came about because we had done so much comedy in, in Baker Street and then we decided, I wonder if we could work a festival here and we did it. And, we do it over four days now. So how, what percentage of, call it the business, does comedy represent now? Because I'm sure part. back in the 80s, I no. mean, who sold a, well, a, nobody could a, have a big venue, you know? Yeah, you couldn't have seen it, you know, yeah. to do one night was a big thing, but yeah. then Tommy broke all records, you know, yeah. like, you know then Darrow Brain just did 50 nights for us just uh, last year, did 50 nights in Vicar Street. Did it over two, uh, three different periods. Yeah. Jason Burns now doing four nights, you know, four or five nights. But when Jason goes to England, he, he's, as big, he's as big as anybody in England. And uh, Des Bishop does very well. And there's, there's new ones coming up all the time. And do you promote in, in England too when those no. guys are there? Or no, no, you just no. keep, keep the punch here. And what do you think is driving that comedy revolution, if you want to call it that? Is it television or what? I think television is yeah. a huge help, you know. And still, still, if you get a good act, no matter what people say, I'll tell you, let's show if you have a good act, we can see the ticket sales. We can yeah. get ticket reports on the hour, 24 yeah. 7, Christmas Day, everything, we get ticket reports. Yeah. And it's amazing the amount of people buy tickets on Christmas morning. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. You know, paperless tickets. So yeah, we get these reports, and it, it can become an obsession. The ticket reports because we get them I all know. the time. Yeah, and we got a breakdown of where every ticket was sold, every wow. county was sold, and whatever. So you can see something like the I've seen people been on the date, and you could see that we could sell 500 tickets that night just in the strength of been on the date. Wow. Now it's gone against us. We've had certain acts. That remain nameless that have gone <laughs> okay. that we've sold nothing and they've said, Did we sell any tickets? Yeah. Uh, a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So So I'm sure there is probably that, that kind of the less glamorous side of the business where, you know, you take a punt on a particular act and for whatever reason it, you, you just don't sell out. Are, are there many times where you just kind of call a gig in advance and say it's it's not gonna work or yeah, well, you do you do. have to kind of suck it up and Go again, or how no? Does you would work? tell them. I mean, of course, yeah. you tell them exactly how it is. But once you're committed, you're committed. Yeah. You know, there's been plenty of shows in the point. The points hold twelve thousand people. We've had four or five thousand people there. Okay. And your break even could be like 85 percent. Mm. So you're in the hole for that amount of money. Yeah. And nobody wants a winger. You know, they want you to pay it. Get out. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get a reputation of winning or winning on the deal, nobody wants to work with you. Yeah. I guess again, that was one of the things you mentioned about. Um, your, your dad, that, that knowing that you, you, you pay. It's, a, it's funny, it's a, one of those things that a reputation takes a long time to build and easy to, yeah. to, easy to dissolve. Um, in terms of the actual music business, we had a lot of uh, 
insights shared here an hour ago about the shift from recorded music to live performance, the, um, the streaming sites, you know, the social media platforms and so on. Has, has a lot of that played into your hands in the promotion game, do you think, just in terms of the shifting sands? And well, I don't think it's shifting sands. I mean, I remember, you know, I've seen bands like play to maybe 100,000 people in, in Ireland, you know, at big outdoors, and then they release a, a DVD of it. And the DVD might sell 5,000 copies. Okay. You know, so that's, yeah. I mean, if that ever come up, that'd be the biggest worry. I mean, whether people are still, still love music, the fact that they don't buy albums anymore, it's just the way, it, it, you know, people yeah. are not going to sit and listen to an al album backwards, you know, yeah. and know every track and know every song. That's just the way it is now. Yeah. They buy songs and they listen to them, but they'll always have somebody come along, like Adele. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, people said they couldn't do what she's doing, but she's going she's gonna to do it, you know? Yeah. And you can see, you know, good music never goes away. Look at Bowie, the charts all over the world. So many albums in the top ten now, you know. That's right. That's right. Did you did you guys ever um, get yeah, a shot at him? We promoted the gig that that what do you call your man? That thirteen year old was allowed in. That what do you call? <laughs> <laughs> we promoted that Slam concert. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. No, he went to Queen. We did the following year Slam. Okay. We did the Glass Spider tour. It was horrendous. Really? It was a daylight show, and he had oh. this show was built for complete darkness. And we had David Boy on and uh, Big Country and uh, Aslan. What a mixture that was. Yeah, it's an unusual mix, all right. Yeah. We, were, we were ahead of the game then. <laughs> you were. <laughs> That's diversity. We, we were trying we to get a was. diverse crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. God. Well, look, they, they, all, they all don't work. Yeah. Um, in terms of, let's say, where you want to go with it, you know, just in terms of the, the, the business and the game of promotions, uh, you know, notwithstanding the unpredictability of, of, of the business, what kind of things are, let's say, call them um, unfulfilled desires or this yearning, let's do this or whatever, you know? What kind of stuff is firing I don't know, you? I mean, it's like going to see Lucinda Williams last week and really enjoying it, you know? Yeah. Or going to see, you know, enjoying Kevin Hart last week or, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not, it's not like a big long-term plan. I, I enjoy it. Like, I don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm dreading going into work today. The, mm. the odd day when there's something you don't want to face up to, somebody you don't want to phone, you know, maybe the business is horrendous and you don't want to tell them. You know, yeah. you try to put it off and say, I'll do it after lunch now. Yeah. Then you say, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. But yeah. now with, mo with the way mobile, f everybody expects you to phone them, you know, email. If somebody sends you an email now, yeah. and sometimes if I don't reply to it straight away, they resend it. I know. You know, so you're <laughs> under no that. Thing, it's yeah. non-stop, but I enjoy yeah. it, you know. Yeah. And the artists are, you know, no matter, you know, sometimes, I don't know, pe people can paint the art, but these people are remarkable people, you know, and the fact that they get on stage means they want to be liked, you know. Yes. And they have the, you know, they are remarkable, no matter if they're selling in Whelan's, or they're in the Point Depot, or they're in Croke Park, they're, you know. So it's an exciting business to be around. It's, uh, there are a lot of young people around it, you know, which is with great, in great vitality in it, and great yeah. work ethic, and, yeah. you know, good people. So and it's a good business, it's not the... But you don't have a long-term plan because you just don't know what's around the corner, you know? Yeah. You just hope you've enough from now till the next yeah. 16 months. Yeah. But it's better than working. Yeah. <laughs> it is. So I was going to ask you that, that question, you know, so that excitement that you had as a 16-year-old um, on the road with, with uh, Rory. Um, but you Rory was incredible now. You've got to remember, like, if Rory was around today, yeah. you know, and he sold like four nights in Ulster on Belfast and a couple of nights in the stadium, he would have sold like 10 nights in the point. Yes. That's how big this guy was because yeah. we we sold every ticket through one outlet. No in Dublin we sold them in one outlet. In Belfast we sold them in one like outlet. Like an actual walk-in shop. One outlet. Shop. Everybody had to yeah. walk in, and we did yeah. a little bit of postal order. Okay. Could you imagine that? Like, that's when people give it a ticket master and the internet and all. But it's the distribution of tickets is incredible. Yes. The access people have to tickets that's is right. incredible. That's right. So an act like Rory, I would you know, they sell out one night in Australia. We had the Boomtown Rats one time when they had just after they had. Uh, they're big rat trap. Yeah. And they, they sold out two nights in Ulster Hall in Belfast, but that's all they could do. Rory, still at that time, was doing four nights in Ulster Hall. Mm. Now, if you had a band like the Boomtown Rats came along today, yeah. they'd be doing multiple nights in the point. Yeah. That's how big they would be. Yes. Because they'd be on every television screen, they'd be yes. every you know, website, they'd be yeah. on it. And it just, yeah. it's a bigger, bigger place and now. Did you have a sense at that time that this guy's big? Or did you know that you were in there? Anybody you know, that anybody had ever seen him would realise just this guy was dynamic, you know. Yeah. He had no yeah. you know, he was dynamic on stage, off stage he was a very quiet, very shy man, but on stage yeah. he was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, has has being in the business and you know, seeing all these, these acts come and go, has it 
impacted your love of music? So let's say when you sit into the car and you put on yeah. uh, music, is it, does it still bring well, you sure, joy sure. or do you oh, get yeah. jaded from, oh, no, shit, no. your man again? Oh, no, no, never, never. No, no, you, are still, you still love listening to music. And, but you tend to listen to the radio more than anything, you know. And, yeah. uh, but you still, I mean, come, and, come down tonight, just when I got, before I got, we just come past Cashel, I put on, uh, I was listening to The River, the new box set that I have, I was listening to it. And I listen to it the whole way back up home now, you know. Yeah. So yeah, no, you never get you never get sick of listening to music ever. Well, we're never getting sick of you bringing yeah. fantastic acts to this know. part of the world and everywhere okay, else. Thanks. Ladies and gents, thanks. Mr. Peter Aiken. Thanks.